Mike Leone starting off with Python for Ruby programmers. Um, one thing about the Ruby community that I have always loved is the fact that there's always been an emphasis on learning and an emphasis on not getting religiously hung up on our language or our tools, you know, to, to take the software craftsmanship and apply it and improve what we're doing even if that means at times taking something that we held sacred yesterday and moving away from it. Um, so the next, like I said, the next talk, this is uh, Mike Leone on Python for Ruby. Then we've got a talk that's going to be about Backbone. And then our, we've got a third talk that kind of delves into JRuby. Um, all important tools, all pieces that help contribute to software development overall, and all of which have some kind of focus on craftsmanship and desire to improve. Um, so with that, that's going to be the next three talks. Um, I would like to introduce Mike. He's a founder of Panoptic Development in Rhode Island. Um, so came to us from the East Coast, not this morning. <laughs> um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to Mike. <laughs> that was weird. Turn the mic over to Mike and uh, let him get started with his presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, guys, welcome to Python for Ruby programmers. Uh, first, I'd just like to apologize for the formatting of this presentation quickly. Um, I had to switch laptops right before I started, <clears throat> so I will uh, post the correct formatting slides uh, online right after this. OK, so this presentation is going to be fast-paced. I'm going to try to teach you guys the basics of Python in about 30 minutes, but don't worry, it's going to be very easy coming from a Ruby background. Um, first, a little bit about me. I'm a founder and principal engineer at Panoptic Development. We build web, mobile, and embedded applications. Uh, the languages we use are primarily Ruby, JavaScript, and of course, Python. So this gives us a little bit different of a perspective from most folks. Uh, we are based in the beautiful state of Rhode Island, which is well known for excellent seafood, massive political corruption, family guy, <laughs> and nothing else. Uh, I started doing Ruby professionally in 2006, and then um, when a specific client application required Python, I started doing Python in 2010. Um, and basically, it's been a great experience. Um, I have a new appreciation for the language design decisions with each programming language, and I think I'm a better Rubyist for it. Uh, so what we'll cover today, uh, we're going to look at a quick example program um, in both languages. We're going to look at 13 language design similarities. We'll look at 13 differences. We'll talk for just a few minutes about five different problem domains and how they apply to each language. And then I'm going to talk about my feelings, which basically means I just get to make all these wild statements and not back them up and not have to prove anything. What we won't cover are details about specific implementations of either of these languages. Uh, we won't talk really about performance, except I'll just say that performance with both tends to be good enough for the problem domains of each language, and that Python tends to perform a little better in most cases. Um, I won't talk about uh, parallelism or multi-threaded programming in each language because I'm not an expert, so I'll just say that the C implementations of each language um, do feature a global interpreter lock, so it is difficult to write um, multi-thread programs that are performant in the C implementations. Um, and I won't talk about minor syntax differences between the two languages, because they're just that. They're minor. I think you're going to get the hang of it really quickly, um, and you'll be able to just read this code easily. What I'm going to try to convince you with this presentation is that the two languages are very similar. And despite some uh, major differences, they're more similar than they are different. Um, Two, you're already ready to start writing Python because of your Ruby experience. The jump is not a big one. Um, learning Python will make you a better Rubyist. And I uh, hopefully will convince you to look into hiring Python programmers, even for Ruby programming positions. Here is um, a few things I've extracted from the Zen of Python that I think are relevant to this presentation. Um, one, explicit is better than implicit. Two, flat is better than nested. Three, readability counts. Four, there should be usually only one obvious way to do something. And five, namespaces are a great idea. Let's do more of those. Um, so for example, uh, let's create a person class in both languages. These are my requirements. 
A person should have a name and an age. A person should be able to greet you. The person should know whether it's Justin Bieber. And the person should be able to greet some folks from the Google Board of Directors. So let's look at the Ruby implementation. This is going to be very straightforward. <coughs> you see that OK? All right. Um, so you basically have a person class. You declare um, an array of Google Directors, and that's a constant scoped within that class. You have a typical initialize method where you set the name and the age. And then you have a few instance methods. Um, the saying the name is in the age is just a simple uh, print statement. Um, I consider you Justin Bieber if your name is exactly Justin Bieber and you're exactly 18 years old. Um, and then uh, greeting the Google directors just loops through this array of directors and prints um, hello for each one. Now let's look at this in Python. OK, so you um, have a person object. Again, you create this Google directors constant scoped within the class at the beginning. You have an initialize function where you uh, uh, set the name and the age. And again, you have these same instance methods. Um, you can see in greeting Google directors, the loop syntax is a little different. You're doing this for name in. Um, but again, it's pretty easy to follow. You might also notice a few little differences here. You see this self uh, parameter is littered all over the place. You'll see uh, the is Justin Bieber method explicitly returns. Um, and there are a few other minor differences. But if we just kind of go back and forth and just visually look at these, they're very similar. I mean, I guess you'll see that the methods don't have an end. They just have a def. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but overall, the design is very, very similar. So let's look at 13 similarities between the languages. They are both dynamically typed. Um, here's a quick Python example. I can just have a, method, a function, print object, which takes some sort of object as a parameter. And as long as that object responds to a read method, it will work. So if I pass in a file, I'll get back the file contents. Another thing that's just like Ruby is pretty much everything is an object. You might even argue that it is more consistent than Ruby because even functions are objects. Uh, more on that later. Um, so here's a Python example. Uh, just like Ruby, 5 plus 3 is 8. But that plus right there is just syntactic sugar provided by the interpreter. There's actually a method that you can call on the integer 5 add. You can say 5.add 3, and you'll get 8 back. Uh, similarly, you can call the string method on 5 and get back uh, 5 as a string. Um, you'll see these underscores here, too, because these are built-in methods, and that's um, a convention in Python. Uh, three, both languages support arrays. So in Ruby, it's called an array. Um, you can put any kind of object in there, and you can access um, elements with the typical integer syntax. I mean, of course, there's a lot of other things you can do with arrays because of enumerable, but this is just the basics. Python calls it a list, but it is basically the same. You have brackets. You can put any kind of object in there. You can get at objects uh, with the integer index syntax. Um, you don't have some of that convenient stuff like dot first, dot last that you would get in Ruby, but overall, they're very similar. So again, we'll go back and forth. Not really much difference here. <laughs> Both languages support hash tables. Um, in Ruby, it's called a hash. <coughs> so here's a color map. This is the Ruby 1.9 syntax. So we have the keys here, and then just some hex values for these different colors. And you can use the bracket notation to um, get the specific uh, value that you want from a key. Um, ooh, that's a typo. In Python, it's called a dict, uh, not a hash. But again, it has very similar syntax to uh, the Ruby 1.9 um, hash syntax. So you uh, just have these keys and values, and then you use the uh, bracket syntax to get at a specific um, element in the dictionary. Um, you'll notice some slight differences here, but nothing major. Basically, instead of just these identifiers for the keys, they're strings. Everything is a string. And when you access um, an element with the bracket syntax there at the bottom, you don't use symbols, you use strings. So Python has no symbols. Everything is a string when you're dealing with hashes. Uh, there's no special line terminators in Python, so no semicolons, unless you really want to add them or want to put a bunch of functionality on one line. Um, number six, there's strong functional programming paradigms in each language, which is very important. So let's take a look at map, which you remember from Ruby. So I, I define a function triple, which just returns uh, the number times three. So I can have a list, and I can run map on that list. So you uh, call the map function. First, you pass in the function that you want, and then the list you want to operate on. Map here is a built-in function in Python, which means it's available everywhere. It's a little different in the way Ruby does things like with enumerable. Uh, similarly, let's look at filter. So uh, here I define a is even function that just returns true if a number is even, or false otherwise. And I can apply that to a list. So this is um, similar to like select in Ruby. I can run filter on that list and only get um, elements that return true with this function. Uh, and then we have anonymous functions in Python. Um, 
called lambdas, which are all, um, also available in Ruby, uh, though it's a little different. So again, with this map function, I don't have to write a function elsewhere. If I don't want to, I can just do a lambda in place like that. So I can say lambda x, x times 3, apply that to the list, and every element will be tripled. Uh, there are some other limitations to lambdas, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, both languages have awesome stuff you can do with um, function slash method parameters. Um, you've got optional or named arguments. So in Python, here's a really quick example. I define a greet function that has a name parameter and an optional greeting parameter that's also named and the default value is hello. Um, so, and this function just prints uh, the greeting to, the, to that person uh, with that name. So if I say greet Bob, it will use the default value of greeting, so it'll say hello Bob. If I um, say greet Bob and then uh, use a name parameter and say greeting equals bonjour, it will say bonjour Bob. But if I don't want to, I don't have to name that parameter since um, it's the last one on the list. So I can just say greet Bob, bonjour, and it will be the same um, result. Um, it also supports argument unpacking. So uh, here um, is a function greet everyone that takes a variable list of names. And for every name in that list, it will say hello to that person. So just like Ruby, I can create um, a list of names and I can call greet everyone and pass in the, um, the list as a variable length parameter list. So again, this will just say hello to each person in the list. Raising and handling exceptions is very similar in both languages. Let's look at Ruby. So in this little example, I set input age to something, and then there's a conditional. If that age is over 25, raise an argument error and just say you have to be under 26. And when you do that, it's obviously going to raise that error because the age is 30. So you get the argument error, and then you get a quick stack trace. Very similar in Python, there's another raise keyword. Uh, this looks very similar, so if the inputted age is over 25, you just say raise value error. The small distinction here is that you're instantiating a value error instance, and you're passing in the string must be under 26. That's an optional parameter, and that is the error message. Um, again, you get a stack trace, and you get a value error. So um, aside from the, the error name coming before the stack trace in Ruby instead of after, this is very, very similar. Uh, some small differences, but the basic control structure here is the same. So um, aside from raising exceptions, we'll talk about handling exceptions. So we know begin, rescue, end in Ruby. Um, so this one will try to execute some code. It's going to divide 23 by 0, but it will rescue the zero division error. It will do some sort of error handling. In this case, just printing, you can't do that, bro. And then um, it will resume program execution. Um, Python uses try except. So again, this is very similar. You're just uh, putting this in a uh, try area here. And um, if you get that error, which you will in this case, a zero division error, um, the same thing will happen. It will, you'll handle it in whatever way you want and resume program execution. So again, we got some different keywords here. And there's this extra end in Ruby at the bottom. But basically, same thing going on. Uh, 10, each language supports some cool stuff for one-line conditionals. Um, so like in Ruby, you put, um, uh, if you want a one-line if, you put the if at the end of the line. So you can say equal if 3 equals 3. In this case, of course, they're equal. So it will um, output uh, equal there. Um, and then you can use JavaScript-style syntax to have an entire if-else statement on one line. So this one um, is 2 equal to 3. If so, uh, equal. Otherwise, not equal. So of course, this will uh, return not equal. So it's a little bit different in Python. Um, even if you're doing a one line in Python, that if goes at the beginning and not the end. So you'd say if 3 equals 3, colon, hello, and that's going to be hello, obviously. Um, and then for the if else in one line, you'd say equal if 2 is equal to 3, else not equal. So of course, that's not equal. It's going to evaluate that at the end. Um, there are a few other little subtleties here about statements versus expressions, but we probably won't have time to get into that. But um, suffice it to say, each language does support similar constructs. Um, Number 11, both languages feature nice interactive shells. Um, in Python, you just um, call, uh, you just invoke Python from the command line with no arguments, and that will give you an interactive shell. If you don't pass in a script to run, it'll just be there in the shell. So you can run any Python code. That's just like herb. The only difference is Ruby has a separate program for um, the interactive shell. Um, both languages have strong object reflection features. Um, so here's a quick example. Uh, apologize for the formatting. But remember our person class from before? So I'll instantiate a person whose name is Steve Bomber, who's 54 years old. Um, and I can call uh, the dict method on that object, which will return a dictionary of the object attributes. I can call something like a class, um, the class method on that object that will return the class. And from there, I can pull out the name of the class if I want to, things like that. Uh, I'm sorry this got cut off a little bit, but Python also supports a built-in dir method. 
um, which will give you uh, all the methods and attributes. So you'll get any constants that you've defined, for example, um, any built-in methods or inherited methods, and then any, um, any attributes or uh, methods that you defined right there. And finally, each language is definitely radically simpler than C++ or Java. So let's talk about 13 differences between the two languages. Uh, one, Python does not have blocks per se. I would consider blocks to be the killer feature of Ruby, the seminal feature of the language, um, because it allows for powerful metaprogramming paradigms. You can create DSLs easily. And um, it's basically blocks, I feel, that al allow you to create some of these great frameworks like Rails. Um, Python has something uh, called uh, decorators, function decorators, that are a powerful feature similar to blocks. Um, they basically let you apply func a function out of context. They let you inject or um, modify code in a function, which is similar to blocks. Um, it's a little different. Um, block uh, <coughs> decorators are a little, um, a little complex. I don't think we're going to have enough time to go into this, but um, that would be a great exercise for the viewers to read up on um, decorators in Python. Maybe if we have time, some time at the end, we could go over that, but um, I'm just going to kind of gloss over that for now. Um, a second major difference is Python has first-class functions. This is something that Ruby lacks, and this is a significant distinction. Um, Python has um, functions as variables, so you can basically uh, pass functions around. Um, so, uh, for example, here I, um, I created an add function that um, just takes two numbers as parameters, it returns the sum. There's a subtract function that takes um, two parameters and returns the difference. Um, but now I've added an additional third function, process numbers, that takes two numbers and a function as an argument. And that will apply that function to the two numbers. So here you see I can call process numbers with 25, pass in the add function, and it will apply that to those uh, parameters. So you get 25. Similarly, you can use, uh, you could pass in subtract to process numbers, and it will be 15. There's a key difference here. So you see when you pass in, like for this line, process numbers 25 add, there's no parentheses after add. If you have a, a method in Ruby and you don't add parentheses, it will just call that method with no parameters. In Python, if you don't add, have parentheses after a method, um, it will return that method, ob uh, that method as an object. So you have that function object that you can pass around to other functions or um, something along those lines. Um, there is similar behavior available in Ruby. You can kind of wrap functions in proc objects and you can still pass those around, do things like that. But strictly speaking, it's not the same as having a first-class function that you can pass around. Um, lambdas in Python are a little different. So number three, um, by design, lambdas in Python must be one line. Um, but that's not a bug. It's a feature in the language, according to the designers. So you can't do something like this in Python. So say I want to just um, run a map on this list of numbers. This that doesn't really mean anything, but I'm just running a map. So if the number is divisible by three, then I'll change the number to zero. If the number is divisible by four, I'll double that number. Otherwise, I'll just keep the number the same. So you can't really do this in Python. You can't have a map function with all these multiple lines of code. But, um, but do you really want to do that? Do you want to have a seven-line anonymous function in your code base that you have to maintain? It's a little harder to test stuff like that. It's harder to follow code like that. And um, it's very easy to accidentally duplicate functionality when you have lots of these like uh, map or filter calls, things like that, with these anonymous functions. When functions are named, it's easier to recognize whether someone's already implemented it. So Python generally pushes you to factor things out into granular methods. That's why they don't let you have lambdas that are multiple lines. So to do this in Python, I would define a separate process num method that takes a number as a parameter and does the same processing on it. And then I can just return um, a call to map, something like that, uh, pass in the function I created, and then pass in a list. Python also supports inner methods to this end. You can define a function within a function. So, um, so, so this is the same example, but I put this in a start, pro so say I'm in a start program function. Within that, I can define process num, and then I can return map on there. This is for if you really don't, for some reason, really don't want to pollute your namespace and keep the, this definition within, scoped within another function, but you still get to name it, and you still get that um, extra readability. Uh, number four, Python has something called tuple, which is an immutable list. I don't particularly like this personally. But um, basically, um, if you have the square brackets, that's a list in Python. You can change it. It's just like an array in Ruby. But if you use uh, parens, that's a tuple. And it, shouldn't, it can't change. If you try to uh, change the list, you'll get an error. Um, a convention is in Python is that tuples should be homogeneous. They should, each element should be the same type of object. But that isn't really enforced. You don't get an error. So um, it's, it's kind of a non-issue. 
Number five, Python has more fine grain importing of like third party libraries, things like that. Let's take an example of Ruby with OpenURI. Um, this is a very simple example, but if you want to open a URL, you require open URI, and then you open the URL. Uh, but there's a few um, interesting points about this. When you require open URI, you bring in everything from that library. You don't uh, get to pick which components of that you want to bring into your program. And this is a very trivial example, but imagine a program that had 10 requires at the top, and then somewhere else in the program, open is called. H how do you know exactly which one of those requires gave you open? How do you know how to refactor the program? How do you know that which requires you can get rid of and which ones are actually needed? Um, so Python does things a little differently. You, um, you usually specify exactly what you want to import from a library. So URL lib2 is, is um, a similar library in Python. So you would say, from URL lib2, import URL open. That's the specific method that you want from that library to open the URL. Um, so again, uh, this goes back to the Zen of Python statement that explicit is better than implicit. Um, and so you could, you could write from URL lib2 import asterisk. That's a, another uh, Python convention to bring in everything. But it is usually not a best practice unless you need you know, like over three things um, from that module. And you can import any number of specific functions or variables from a Python uh, module, which basically is a Python file. Number six, I don't know why this is such a big deal, but Python enforces indentation. Um, a lot of people seem to have uh, an issue with this, or they're uh, creeped out by it, or so something like that. But in practice, I would say this is actually pretty awesome. I actually wish Ruby enforced indentation like this. Um, it doesn't really cause any headaches. It doesn't make development take any longer. Your programs won't even run if the indentation isn't right. So it's always correct. And it makes coding style much more consistent. Um, number seven, Python has more values that evaluate to false. Um, in Ruby, uh, false and nil are the values that evaluate to false. In Python, you have false, you have none, which is Python's nil, and then an empty list, an empty tuple, an empty hash, empty string will all evaluate to false. Uh, and also um, zero, wh whether that's an integer or like a decimal, will also evaluate to false. I think these are all pretty sane, except maybe arguably zero. Um, but there are so many hoops we jump through, like in Rails, things like that, where we're trying to also make empty things evaluate to false. So I think this is a big help in Python. I think this was a good design decision. So Python doesn't have enumerable, which is another great feature of Ruby. Um, Python has the, the built-in functions, like I just talked about, filter, map, reduce, things like that, which are very convenient, but I don't, it's not as powerful as enumerable. Um, there are also a few other third-party libraries in Python, like uh, funk tools is something you can import to get some of that functionality, but I just, uh, I've never known it to be as elegant as um, enumerable in Ruby. Uh, number nine, Python has simpler conditionals. Um, there are no case statements. Um, you just use an if, elif, else ladder. So instead of else if, in Python, it's just elif, but um, basically you would use this kind of control structure instead of a case statement. Um, in this particular code example, it just looks at the value of a number, and depending on what the value is, it will print out a different line. Um, so you would just use that instead of, say, a case statement in Ruby. Python has no unless, which I am very excited about. I loved unless when I first learned Ruby. Now I hate it. Um, here's a great example from the 37 Signals blog. <laughs> unless not person.present and not company.present, do you even know what you're doing? And then if you add an else to something like that, it's just it's horribly confusing. <clears throat> There's no automatic return values in Python. I, again, I like this feature in Ruby. I'm sad it's not here. but. Um, Functions will return none if they don't have an explicit return statement. So if I'm writing some Python and I um, just wrote some Ruby the day before, maybe I'm still in that mindset, I'll do something like this, and um, I won't put an explicit return statement, and I'll get none, and I'll kind of be confused. But um, maybe I wouldn't if I only wrote Python. Um, again, going back to the example of the person class, you have this self argument um, to every class instance method. Um, so th this is something that I think um, has pros and cons, um, but basically every instance method and object you have to pass in self, a reference to, um, to the, that object. Um, the good thing is that this is explicit. Um, there are no clashes with local variables or other imported objects. Sometimes you can get confused by that um, in Ruby. Like there, you may have defined a method um, number in a class, but maybe you also have a, a method argument called number or an instance variable, something like that. And you can be a little confusing. Um, so I think that's good, but um, on the con side, it's just more verbose. You kind of feel like you have these self um, variables all over your classes, and it sometimes it just seems verbose compared to Ruby. But um, here's a quick example. This is a simplified person object. Um, so you instantiate it just with a name, 
And then um, there's this method say hi to, and that takes name as one of the arguments, but there's no namespace class here. You say self.name um, if you want the uh, attribute on the object, or you can just say name if you just want to use that local variable. There's no powerful module mix-ins like Ruby. Uh, you can get similar behavior, but generally you're only talking about multiple inheritance in Python, which I don't particularly like. Um, and 13, Ruby has stronger metaprogramming features. Um, Python definitely has some metaprogramming features, but it doesn't have things like define method, class eval, method missing, um, all these great things that basically allow a framework like Rails to work the way it does. Um, you can't open a class and extend it. If you open a class, you're going to overwrite it. Um, you can't extend built-in types either, but maybe that's for the better, because I'm sure we've all been bitten by that at some point. All right, now let's quickly look at just five problem domains, and just for a minute, uh, quickly talk about them at a high level. Number one is web development. Is there anyone here who um, writes Ruby for their day job but does not consider themselves a web developer? Zero, wow. Okay, at a Python conference, this probably wouldn't happen unless it was a Django conference. Um, so Ruby has Rails, Sinatra, those are the big, um, the big apps for web development, and uh, they're great, I love to use them both. Um, and the Ruby community is dominated by web development. Virtually everyone who codes Ruby um, writes for the web, and they write web applications. Um, Python also has a lot of cool stuff. That Django is the most popular full stack uh, web development framework. Zope and Pylons are other ones. Um, Flask is a minimalist framework similar to Sinatra for Ruby. Um, but in general, web development is just one piece of this huge Python community that spans all these other problem domains. Uh, let's, let's look at mobile applications real quick. Well, neither language is really that popular for mobile apps. Um, but there are some pretty cool Ruby projects. There's Real Mobile Roads, which lets you use a Rails type of paradigm to make cross-platform mobile apps. Um, there's Ruby Motion, which um, has definitely been making the rounds at conferences lately, and that's really cool for building um, iOS apps um, in Ruby as well. So I would say maybe um, Ruby is a little bit ahead here, but I, I wouldn't say that either language is hugely popular for mobile apps. Um, let's talk about desktop applications, if, if anyone still builds those. Um, Python has like uh, Qt bindings, GTK bindings, WX widgets bindings. Um, Ruby also has those, it also has uh, things like shoes, um, but none of the Ruby libraries are really in widely used or mature. Um, I was actually doing a little research for this talk and I was Googling some uh, Python projects that use some of these libraries and um, there was a lot. I was really impressed. Um, there was just much more activity going on than I had expected. Um, let's talk about scientific programming for a minute. Um, Python has NumPy, SciPy, these are very widely used, especially kind of in the academic finance type um, problem domains. Um, Ruby, I don't think, has any real mature scientific or numeric libraries. I know some folks are trying to change this and there has been some activity, but um, I think for now the Ruby community is probably still playing catch up. Um, finally, I'll just talk for a second, if I have to, about Windows deployment. Um, I do consulting and eventually, every couple of years, this kind of comes with the territory, no matter how much you try to avoid it. Uh, you have to de deal with things on Windows and occasionally deploy things. Um, Ruby, um, there's been Rails installer in the past few years and that's great, but that doesn't, I don't think that really targets deployment. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's more for um, development environments on Windows. Um, JRuby definitely makes deployment much easier. Things like Torquebox, I think, have uh, made things go a long way. Um, but I would still say that Python on Windows is generally easier. And I don't think this is just because of the, um, the language. I think it's because the entire tool chain is well supported. If I want to deploy a Django application, for example, on Windows, I know that Python will work well and Django will work well, yes, but also any other libraries, um, if an image processing library, my database adapter, are all gonna be well supported on Windows. Um, and I think the Windows neglect is kind of self-perpetuating, even though some folks are trying to change that. Um, the fact is that if I, if I open source a Python project and it's popular, a bunch of people are going to be trying to get that to work on Windows. That's not always the case with Ruby. So even if we say that we want things to work well on Windows, um, we won't get that kind of, I don't think we'll get that kind of organic growth um, for Windows support the way Python already has. And I think that maybe that's because Python was popular earlier when Windows kind of more dominated uh, the scene. But, um, And um, in general, I would just say the Python community is just bigger, just simply because um, it spans all these uh, problem domains. Um, I, I'm in the Boston area, so um, if I go to, a, the Boston RB meetups are definitely really big um, and really fun, but um, the, the Boston Python meetups are huge. I, I couldn't believe it. Sometimes there's like a thousand people at a meeting. It's like one, a once a month meeting. It's, it's crazy. And the people that I meet are working on all these different types of problem domains. It's, it's really interesting. Um, okay, now I'm gonna talk about my feelings. 
I think it's harder to write code that pisses off other developers in Python. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, <laughs> the, gra the grammar in Python is smaller. Like I said, there's fewer ways to handle conditionals, the, the things like that. And so the way that you envision good Python code looking is probably very similar to the, your coworker who, al who also writes Python. Um, definitely not always the case in Ruby. There's plenty of contentious stuff um, in terms of you know, standards, coding practices, things like that. Also, you have forced indentation, which I think makes things a bit more re readable. Um, you know, uh, the source of imported functionality is very obvious because of more fine-grained import statements. Um, and I think just the explicit nature of things, even though maybe it's more verbose when you're writing, makes it easier to read. Um, I do think Ruby is more elegant. Like, I feel like um, it's, you can, it's more powerful. You can do more expressive things. But in practice, Python just seems to always be easier to read, as much as I want Ruby to be easier to read. And um, I would say Rails still wins for web development. Um, if you're doing a web development project, I would generally still pick uh, Rails or maybe Sinatra if it was a small project, um, you know, unless there's some specific um, concern that lends itself to Python, maybe Windows deployment or something very tied to the Django use case. And um, I think that nothing as good as Rails will ever be implemented in Python uh, because, like I said, the, meta the different types of metaprogramming reflection features that you get in Ruby um, allow for some of the more interesting Rails features. And I think that. Um, you just wouldn't be able to have the same type of interface in Python. Um, finally, um, do you need to hire a Rubyist? Maybe you should consider hiring a Python programmer uh, instead. Um, how many people here have had trouble hiring Ruby developers before? <laughs> okay, funny. Does anyone just have a really easy time finding Ruby developers and it's just really quick and easy to hire them, they don't need to be paid much and it's great? Okay, no one. Yeah, the Ruby developer market is kind of out of control. Uh, it's, it's definitely in developers' favor right now. And um, if any guys are into, uh, you know, kind of the more uh, personnel management at your companies, you work for smaller companies, you have to deal with hiring folks, um, there's a lot more Python developers. Um, we have put out job postings on our local Ruby mailing list for a Ruby programming position. We also put uh, the posting on the local Python mailing list and, you know, told people, um, even if you have no Ruby experience, that's okay. We're looking just for good Python developers anyway. And we had, like, five or, no, probably like 10 times as many responses from the Python mailing list just because of the, the activity and the different nature of the developer market, Python. And I, I've noticed, um, I mean, my company's small, so this only happened to us maybe two times, but I would say that um, in my experience, Python programmers can, dev can ramp up for Ruby very quickly, much faster than, say, a Java developer, something like that, by which I mean hours or days if they're an experienced programmer instead of, you know, weeks or months to really get a feel for the language. All right, so let's wrap things up quickly. One, I think the languages are very, very similar, more so than they're different, and I hope I've convinced you of that. Um, two, I hope I've convinced you that you're already ready to jump into Python, so I urge you to give it a try. Three, um, I think that learning Python will make you a better Ruby programmer. And four, um, you should consider hiring a Python programmer, even for a Ruby programming position. Uh, and that's it. You can um, find uh, our website at panopticdev.com. My blog is leone.panopticdev.com. And you can find us on Twitter at PanopticDev, or you can find my personal account on Twitter at um, FaceBiff. Um, and now I'll take any questions. Right, th th that's right. The question is, is method chaining um, different in Python or less popular? And uh, yes, that's definitely the case. Um, you can't e as easily um, chain methods like that. And I think part of that is because of the nature of the language, and part of that is the way that um, the standard library was designed. Lots of these sort of string and array processing functions um, are not as easily chainable. Um, I, in a previous version of the presentation, I had an example where you would uh, take a sentence that was a string, you would do some string replacement on it, break it up into words, reverse the words, and then put it back into a string. That's a bunch of lines of code in Python, and it's one nicely short chained line in Ruby. So there's definitely better support in Ruby for um, paradigms like that. All right, I guess that's it. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, thank you. <laughs>